Jeff Fuchs. Hey everyone, please go on mute. Hello, hello. Morning, Chris. Hey, how's it going? You find your way, Alexis, finally. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, this morning's broadcast is coming to you from downtown Seattle in the lift offices. Awesome. Yeah, I haven't explained to Matt yet that one of the DD processes is verifying that at least one maintainer is alive. Brian uh, Cantrell can't make it this morning. He just shot me a note saying that's first day of school. <laughs> so no worries. Well, I'll mark Brian as can't make it. Hey all, we'll get started at about five past uh, the hour. So far, I just have Alexis from the TOC. Anyone else here that I've missed? Chris, this is Steve Watts. I'm just lurking just to awesome. get how it goes. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Thanks, thanks for making it.
All right, I see Brian Grant. Good morning, Brian. Hello, everyone. Morning, Chris. Hey, Chris, would you display the slides, please? Sure. Give me a second. <laughs> You see them now? Is that a yes? No? Yes. Awesome. We'll get started in a couple more minutes. Morning, Chris. Hey, Ben. Mark, you as a tenant. Anyone else in the TOC on the call besides Brian, Ben, and Alexis? I'm here. Hey, Camille. How's it going? Good. How are you? Is Ken or Jonathan on the phone? The downside of Zoom, you can never figure out who's calling in. All right, it's about a uh, five past. Um, we'll get started. Alexis, are you on? I am. Can you uh, uh, get us going? Yeah, I'll get it going. So uh, I'll check attendance uh, at the end of the call. All right, off to the agenda slide. Okay, go ahead, Alexis. So welcome back, everybody. Um, today's agenda is really around um, a check-in on the nursery project and a presentation from... Matt Klein from uh, Lyft about Envoy, and also a working group readout and discussion around CI. Uh, I think there are a few other things, but those are the main items for today. Um, a reminder that we have a operating principles document. The news item on this is that the governing board has agreed to uh, formally review and then ratify this document. Uh, the ratification process is intended to bring us to a conclusion in mid-September. So we have a few weeks left for members of the CNCF, TOC community, anybody to come in, look at this document and comment on it. Um, Dan is moving it into GitHub and he's splitting it into two pieces. So the um, principles piece is one half and the recommendations and asks for the GB from the TOC is another half. Um, do we have a link for that yet, Chris, that people can go and comment on? Not yet publicly shared. Uh, okay, uh, so yeah, please, please keep commenting on the existing document. Right. Because okay. we're going to preserve that anyway. Yep. Okay, so we'll use the document for comments until Dan and Chris let us know that we should stop yep. via the TOC list. Okay? Sounds good. 
for my part, the weak point in the document is still there's, there's some sketchiness around uh, governance. I think we may leave, leave some of that as a gap to be filled out after September, but please do have a look and, and comment if you want to. Thank you. Um, let's talk about the conferences next. Uh, Dan and Chris, do you want to just walk us through this? I, I will uh, just briefly. So uh, the biggest event of the year is going to be in Austin, Texas, December 6th through 8th, Cloud Native Con, KubeCon. We are um, splitting it a little bit this year. So on the 6th is going to be Cloud Native Con, particularly focused on the nine uh, non-Kubernetes uh, projects. 7th and 8th will be KubeCon. Um, it will also cover the other projects, but how those projects interact with Kubernetes and then anything Kubernetes related. Um, but you have exactly six days left. So please, if you were thinking of submitting a talk, focus on it now. Please reach out to the, your colleagues at your company. Um, this is really just a fantastic opportunity. It's going to be by far the largest event we've ever done. We're, we're really pretty thrilled with the excitement behind it. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Um, project review and backlog. Um, the links here are to the uh, priority sheet, which has been drafted by myself uh, for the TOC to look at, and to Chris's backlog um, document. We are, I think, potentially ready to um, move to a vote on Notary. There's been some diligence discussion in, in GitHub, um, and I would like to know if, with, with a sort of show of hands, does anybody who has a vote in the TOC feel strongly that we should not uh, move forward to voting on Notary at this time. We would be happy to leave a, a longer diligence window open. Um, there has been some discussion around details. So I now invite anybody who has a vote to state that they don't want to uh, declare the DD window closed. Uh, can, can we have an, at least another week? Yep, yeah. yeah, absolutely fine. Um, in that case, I think that what we should do is aim to, um, so Solomon is away on vacation at the moment, and obviously he is somebody, probably the best person to champion uh, this project as a sponsor. Uh, so I think we should just essentially wait until he gets back. Um, what I'd also like to do is ask if anybody who is a non-voting TOC contributor would like to um, help with some of the DD here. For example, I believe that Quinton Hull had asked if he could help out with any of this stuff. Is he on the call today? Yeah, I'm here and I can help. Great. Yeah. Really so, Qu Quinton, that would be appreciated. I think there are some uh, use cases that are relevant to uh, container images that aren't very well articulated how they're addressed or whether they're addressed, but in general, um, a, like a summary of the strengths and weaknesses. Uh, relative to some of the use cases would be helpful as a summary. Uh, I just asked another question this morning. Um, Alexis and Chris, there are also some, I think, structural issues with the yep. proposal that need to be resolved, like whether Notary and Tough should be yep. the same uh, proposal or separate proposals. Yep. And uh, Notary actually contains a fork of another Tough, Go Tough library. Yep. Um, so there are questions maybe about whether that should be split out separately or moved to the tough project or whether we can get the original uh, project donated as well. Cool. So it would be useful for someone to chase those down. Yeah, I can do that. Thank you. So Quinton, as a next step, could you email me and Brian and Chris and we'll discuss how you can help. I uh, yep. really appreciate it. Sure, will do. Okay, Chris, <clears throat> um, given that Mr. Cantrell is away, could you give us a readout on where we're at on Jaeger? Yeah, so just a quick little update here is, so the Jaeger team has put together a project proposal that's ready to, for some wider commentary uh, from the TOC and the wider community. Um, they're not ready yet to submit it to uh, GitHub for kind of the formal um, process, but uh, they would appreciate if you'd comment on their Google Doc uh, over the next uh, week or so. Uh, and if people are happy with it, they'll submit it uh, through GitHub formally uh, to get it ready for a vote. All right, any questions on the slide? 
No questions, let's move on. Right, <clears throat> so this really is a further you know, iteration on the remark I made a few minutes ago um, involving uh, Quinton as a DD volunteer. The, the simple fact is that in order to maintain um, any reasonable pace um, in terms of project acceptance, combined with a high standard for acceptance, uh, the TOC voting members are soliciting help from the community. It's as simple as that. Um, there are other ways you can help as well, but this is, this is one of the most important right now. Uh, so I'm going to now call for anybody who is a non-voting member to let Chris know and Dan if you would like to help with any work in the future, such as technical due diligence on projects. Um, you may be asked to help with Envoy or Jaeger due diligence, for example, in the future. Okay, sure. please, please do that offline. Um, or if you feel uh, very bold, you may publish to the public list. Cool. Okay. Next slide. Great. Um, I actually don't know what this one is. So what's the... Yeah. <laughs> sure. I, I could speak briefly on this one, Alexis. Um, you know, this is just a, a very simple survey that we're going to be putting together for our maintainer and project community. Uh, it's just basically a simple uh, way to gauge kind of project satisfaction and really where projects need more help. So um, just asking uh, the TOC and the wider community to uh, make any final comments uh, on the survey before we launch it, uh, hopefully next week, across our maintainer community. So thanks. Great. Okay, next slide, please. It's off to Envoy and Matt. Right, so I'm now gonna mute myself and Matt, who's sitting, sitting next to me, is going to unmute himself and talk about Envoy. Do you want me to share, share my... my... You're in okay. You want me to share my screen? Share the slides. Alexis, you may need to mute yourself. I'm getting some feedback. And can there there anyone not speak here while you're sharing? Oops. Hey, Chris. It hey, says that I, I can't share while someone else is sharing. All right, here. We'll, we'll switch off then. Not a problem. Go for it. Is everyone able to see my screen? All good. All good, okay. Thanks everyone, my name is Matt Klein. Uh, I'm a software engineer from Lyft. Uh, I lead our networking team here. Um, so we obviously work a lot on Envoy, but we also do a bunch of other things related just to general networking within Lyft, like DNS and uh, dealing with AWS and all those fun things. Uh, so today we'll be talking about Envoy. Um, so before we actually dive into Envoy, I'm just going to spend a minute or two kind of giving an overview of the state of microservice networking. Um, so kind of when you look around the landscape right now, we have a lot of people that are starting to kind of ramp up on microservice architectures. Um, and that's leading to, frankly, a lot of chaos. Uh, and that involves a whole bunch of different components. So we have a lot of languages and frameworks. It's uh, very uncommon these days for companies to, you know, be able to use only Java or only C++. Now we have companies that are uh, you know, building services in four or five different languages. Uh, we obviously have a lot of different protocols. You know, we have REST and you know, we have databases and caching. We have binary prototype protocols. So there's just lots of different protocols floating around. Uh, we have a huge variety of different infrastructures. So we have uh, people that are still running bare metal on premise. We have, you know, people that are running on VMs. Uh, we have people that are running on containers. Now we have functions as a service. So huge variety. Uh, then there's obviously all the load balancers. And these again range from, uh, you know, old school proprietary hardware boxes to cloud vendor solutions to software appliances. Uh, and probably most importantly, out of all of these different systems, you know, we have a, a, a huge variety in what comes out. 
So we have stats, we have tracing, we have logging. Most people don't even have tracing. Uh, but the idea here is that, you know, given your large variety of languages and frameworks and protocols and infrastructures and load balancers, uh, you're likely getting different stats, different tracing and different logging out of all of these components. So it's, it's incredibly difficult to understand what's actually going on. On top of that, you know, we have these kind of distributed systems networking best practices, uh, you know, and those include things like retry, circuit breaking, rate limiting, timeouts. Uh, and these are things that we all know that we're supposed to do, but the honest reality is that a lot of people have partial implementations. Uh, they might have broken implementations. They might not have any implementations. And most importantly, they have different implementations, particularly based on whatever language and whatever framework they're actually using. Then we get into authentication and authorization, where uh, a lot of people don't have anything. <laughs> some people are using basic auth. Some people have a very complicated mutual TLS-based system. So there's a there's a huge variety here in terms of authorization. You know, people are are, are doing very simple role-based systems to hugely complicated policy language systems. Uh, and on top of all of this, and this is somewhat related to languages and frameworks, we have lots of different libraries, you know, and these libraries range from very simple libraries uh, like the curl library and PHP to libraries like Finagle, you know, that are, that are very complicated and have lots of different things in them. Uh, but the idea here again is that these libraries, uh, you know, they range in, in complexity, they range in features, uh, and they output different stats. And, uh, you know, for companies that are programming in four or five or six different languages, if they want to have robust systems, they then have to actually go through and, you know, they have to implement all of these features in their four or five different libraries. So that yields this, which is the really big and confusing mess. And, and what I like to tell people or, you know, is, is that everyone wants their microservice architecture, but what it really comes down to at the end of the day, uh, you know, from my perspective is good observability and quality networking. And what I typically find is that people that don't have these things, they get very frustrated and they don't trust the network. And, and then they don't feel that the microservice architecture is actually appropriate for them. And then they abort. Uh, and this is a problem that I've seen many, many times. So getting into Envoy, uh, you know, this is just a quick refresher. Uh, overview. Uh, so the idea behind Envoy is that we have a single sidecar proxy. Uh, it's a self-contained server like Nginx or HA proxy. Uh, the idea here is that all the things that I showed you on that previous slide you can implement in one place. So you can have you know complicated retries, timeouts, back pressure, uh, you can have consistent stats, logging and tracing, uh, you can have robust protocol support and you can do this all in one place. And from a service perspective, the service only knows about Envoy. So the service will talk to its local Envoy, it'll send requests, Envoy will do load balancing, service discovery, all of these things, and then it'll get the response and it'll return that response to the service. So from the service perspective, it's a very powerful paradigm because for the most part, uh, the service does not need to be aware of the actual network. So let's do just a quick rundown of Envoy features. So like I was saying before, uh, it's an out of process architecture. So we are not doing a library approach. Uh, the benefit here being for a slight degradation in performance. Uh, people always ask, what's the performance overhead? Uh, again, it depends on, on what, what you're doing and what is configured. Um, but let's say that it's you know, less than one millisecond per hop. Uh, for a slight performance degradation, the, the benefits that you get from being able to deploy changes everywhere to having consistent feature set is super, super powerful. Uh, it's written in C++11, uh, modern code base, uh, very fast, uh, very, very productive. Um, at its core, uh, Envoy is actually an L3, L4 filter-based architecture. Uh, so, so it's really a byte proxy. And the reason that's interesting is that you can build up complicated uh, filters that do different protocols. So for example, we can support REST, we can support gRPC, but we can also support MongoDB, Redis, S-Tunnel, MySQL, whatever. Obviously, REST is a, a huge, huge uh, part of the modern internet. So Envoy uh, supports a huge amount of uh, functionality at that layer. Uh, so we have a whole L7 filter stack. Um, you know, to operate on things like headers and body and, and trailer. 
Envoy is an H2 proxy first, which is relatively novel for modern proxies. Uh, most proxies that exist today were built in, a, in an H1 universe. Uh, and as it turns out, uh, doing by, you know, uh, proxy back and forth from H1 to H2 and H2 to H1 can be actually quite, quite complicated. So Envoy was built uh, with that from the get-go. Um, and that allows us to work with a large, large number of different protocols. Um, we do service discovery, obviously, uh, and we do a combination of active and passive health checking. So active health checking is out of band pings, like requesting the slash health check endpoint. Passive health checking is actually monitoring in band traffic. So for example, if you receive uh, three consecutive 500s in a row, you might boot a, a backend host. We do a whole bunch of advanced load balancing features. So these are things like retry, timeouts, circuit breaking, rate limiting, request shadowing, outlier detection. And most importantly, and you're gonna hear me say this over and over and over again, it's all about observability. So Envoy does a huge number of stats, logging, and we also uh, form a trace route. Uh, and currently we have trace support for both Zipkin as well as Lightstep. Uh, we don't currently have Prometheus support. Uh, that's something that uh, people have been asking for a lot on Twitter recently. Would love to see that added. Um, and, uh, oh, right, so from a stats perspective, the current stats uh, provider is StatsD. Uh, but again, would, would love to see uh, different providers there. Uh, and, and Envoy is also uh, very usable as an edge proxy, which means that we've invested a lot in edge TLS features. This turns out to be very important because a lot of companies historically, they use something like Nginx at the edge and then they use HAProxy internally. And what that means from an operations perspective is that operations staff need to learn how to operate two very different proxies. Uh, as it turns out, 90% of what these things do uh, from an internal load balancer perspective and from an edge perspective are the same. So having the same software be runnable in both places is, is very, very powerful from a ops perspective. All right, um, so one of the primary goals of, of Envoy is really that it is kind of a quote, universal data plane. And, and by that, I mean that um, Envoy supports a set of APIs uh, that can integrate with various management systems kind of to do general data plane processing. Um, and, you know, that, that ends up being very important because, you know, when you're down at the base data plane layer, you can support a large variety of different features, but as you get closer and closer to the customer, things just naturally become a little more opinionated, right? So if you're, if you're on premise, you're going to need different configuration management than, than if you're doing something like Istio. Um, so, you, you know, having a set of APIs uh, that are simple and easy to implement, uh, and allow different management systems to actually control Envoy remotely end up being very powerful. So uh, the V1 version of the APIs that we have are based on JSON REST. Um, and we have four different APIs. Uh, one of them is the service discovery service, SDS. Uh, this is historical and poorly named. Uh, this is basically a mechanism uh, by which Envoy uh, can look up backend host by name. You could think of it as like DNS++. Uh, we have the Cluster Discovery Service API. Uh, this allows Envoy to discover all of the backend clusters. Clusters are sets of hosts. So for example, uh, you know, the user service or the location service or the auth service. We have uh, the Route Discovery Service. Uh, this allows us to kind of uh, learn about L7 route tables. Uh, and then we have the listener discovery service. This lets us actually discover entire listeners, meaning listen on a particular port uh, and set up a particular filter chain. So for example, uh, you know, give me some rate limiting, give me some buffering, routing, et cetera. We've uh, been working with Google uh, and we're moving now towards kind of a set of V2 APIs. Uh, and the, the, the goal of the, of the V2 APIs is to make them strongly typed uh, via gRPC. Uh, we'll also support JSON. Uh, we'd like to support bi-directional streaming. Uh, but in, in, in general, they're really the same as V1, but the main benefits again are this bi-directional streaming so that we don't have to do polling, uh, strongly typed APIs. Uh, and enhance features. And some of the things that we're doing here 
are we're working towards uh, the endpoint discovery service uh, EDS that will replace SDS. Uh, so it's it's quite similar, basically DNS plus uh, plus, but because it's bidirectional, we'll actually be able to report host load info, um, and that will allow the management system or a global load balancer to actually make more uh, more intelligent uh, thoughts. Um, then we've got the cluster discovery service API that's very similar, uh, RDS similar, LDS similar. We're adding the health discovery service. Uh, this will allow Envoy uh, to actually be used as part of a uh, centralized yet distributed health checking system. Um, so a management server could assign a subset of Envoys to health check backend nodes, report that information to a central management server, and then make those health decisions. And finally, uh, we'll be working on the aggregated discovery service. This is the ADS. Um, and the idea here is that uh, we can allow all of the different streaming kind of APIs to be served by, by a single stream. Um, and this is useful for management servers that would like things to uh, happen in a particular order. So for example, CDS could be followed with EDS, could be followed with RDS for uh, kind of no, no drop sequencing. All right, so let's talk a little bit about history. Uh, the project was uh, born uh, in May of uh, 15. Uh, we opened source in September of 16. Uh, as of yesterday, we have 69 contributors. Uh, there's two orgs with commit access, that is Lyft and Google. Uh, I, I like to joke that there's now more people at Google working on Envoy than there are at, at Lyft, and that's not really a joke. I think it's actually true. Um, so we have approximately 10 full-time people working on Envoy uh, across Lyft and Google. Uh, we expand out to about 20 part-time people. Uh, if you include uh, folks from Lyft, Google, IBM, and several other companies. Uh, we have a, a, a really exciting growing community. Uh, this has been really fun for me to see. I never in my wildest dreams could have imagined that we would be where we are today. Um, so there's a partial list there uh, of users slash contributors. Um, we've got some fairly high profile integrations coming. Uh, obviously, you've all heard of Istio. Uh, there's Nomad from Verizon. Uh, there's other companies in this space, Tigera, Covalent, Turbine Labs, DataWire, uh, that are doing their own integrations. Uh, and there's more on the way. Um, I don't have good kind of numbers on other company deployment. I can tell you about Lyft's deployment of Envoy. Uh, we deploy Envoy of tens of thousands of hosts, uh, hundreds of services. We regularly do about 3 million requests per second across the uh, Lyft mesh. Um, from a competitive standpoint, uh, the primary competitors uh, to Envoy are Nginx, HAProxy, obviously the cloud load balancing solutions, uh, SmartStack, Linkerd, as well as Traffic. Um, Envoy differentiates from these solutions by A, uh, focusing on performance. It's extremely high performance. It has equal or greater performance to Nginx as well as HAProxy. Um, and then uh, from a configurability standpoint, uh, you know, from those universal data plane perspective, it has kind of that, that central management solution uh, from, from these other options. So it's kind of that combination of universal data plane and perf. Okay, uh, from a roadmap perspective, uh, we're going to be uh, officially shipping Redis support. We're already using this in production at, at Lyft, but we'll be getting this documented, blogging, et cetera. Uh, Redis support is basically replacing Twitter's Nutcracker, so doing clustered Redis uh, from Envoy. Um, fleshing out and finishing the V2 API implementation. Uh, folks at Google are doing a great job on this. We'll expect to probably have parity with V1 in the next month or two. Uh, yet more work on rate limiting as well as IP tagging, uh, looking towards kind of integrated DDoS solutions. Um, a big focus on TLS, there's been a lot of community requests from different folks around uh, different types of key delivery. So whether those come from a new KDS, you know, key service, uh, or they come from disk, or there's disk watching, or they're encrypted or not, there's, you know, people want, you know, tons of different things. Uh, and then focus on authentication and authorization support. So there's obviously spiffy effort, uh, there's Istio auth, um, there's Firebase policy, there's the OPA policy. So there's a bunch of interesting integrations here. Uh, Microsoft is committed to doing a Windows port. Uh, we actually just got OSX support also. Uh, 
Travis is a, is a pretty constant pain point for us for CI, so kind of figuring out a better CI system for us. Uh, working on H2 prefetch, link following, and push promise, uh, UDP and quick support. Um, and then continuing again on this vision of global load balancing. So, you know, you can push a lot of functionality into the data plane, but when you build more complicated management servers, there's a, there's a huge amount of fascinating things that, that can end up happening. And I, I think the project will in the next year, frankly, transition uh, a lot more to innovative work on the management server side than on the Envoy data plane side. Uh, and then there's always requests for more L7 protocols, so whether it be Kafka or MySQL or Postgres or whatever. All right, so uh, from you know, a, a CNCF donation, uh, you know, what, what is Envoy hoping to kind of uh, work with CNCF on? Um, we'd love help with governance advice. Uh, Envoy has grown way faster than I, I would ever have imagined, uh, and having access to staff who can help kind of give advice on how to set up governance structures and how to, how to run the project would be super uh, helpful. Um, getting access to event organizing. So, you know, taking over our Twitter account, help with meetups, conferences, promotion, et cetera. Um, GitHub issue tracking is already not, not working so well for us. So we'd love to explore with CNCF better issue tracking techniques, whether that's Jira or something else. Um, would like help with figuring out a better security process. So kind of a official CVE process, how to run it, whether we have pre-announced lists, things like that. Um, CLA in general is a constant pain point for us. Uh, so working with lawyers to kind of figure out if we can move to DCO and kind of just how to manage the entire CLA process with bots. Uh, and then CI build, like I was saying before, is a, is a pretty big pain point. So we've got some solutions there in the pipe, but it would be great, you know, to kind of work with CNCF on, on what a, uh, a better CI build solution would actually look like. Um, so that's basically all I had. Uh, I, I, I'm super excited about this. I, I think, um, you know, I, I think Envoy, that combination of performance as well as universal data plane makes it fairly unique. Uh, I think there's a huge amount of synergy uh, between Envoy and the existing CNCF projects. Uh, we already have a lot of integrations going. Uh, there's a lot of other integrations that are possible that I think would be super awesome. Uh, and, you know, with the momentum that we have today, uh, you know, it's my goal and, and the project's goal, I, I think within three to five years to see Envoy running a, a large percentage of the world's internet traffic. Uh, you know, and, and I think working with CNCF to kind of make that happen would be pretty awesome. Um, so thank you. Uh, you, you know, this is, uh, it's been fun to chat with you all and I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Yes. We have about five minutes for questions. No one, come on. <laughs> Someone's got to have a question. Yeah, I have, uh, a I have a question, Matt. This is Brian Grant. Um, okay. you mentioned the new, Endpoints discovery API was going to include load information. Does the existing API already include health information? Uh, no. Yeah, so that's a new addition in the V2 APIs. Okay. Um, is, is there documentation for those APIs? Or are they, they yep. still in the proposal stage? No, no. Uh, they're, they're actually already being implemented. So there's a GitHub repo, uh, lift slash envoy dash API. I can send email or I'll just type it in here somewhere. Hold on. Uh, I'll just. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah I had one other question. It's Quinton here. Um, are you able to give any details about uh, current usage of it outside of Lyft? You mentioned a bunch of integrations, but it wasn't clear uh, to what extent it was being used in any of those environments? Sure. Uh, let me let me pull up the list that I have here. Um, you know, it's it's hard for me to say, right? Because I, I just don't go around and I, I I don't track different companies in terms of what what stage they're at. Um, it's definitely being used in production at Verizon at I think relatively large scale uh, via Nomad. Um, it's, uh, I know it's being used in production at Stripe, at VSCO, I believe at Tencent QQ. I'm not sure of the state of others, 
uh, if that's an important thing, I can probably do a survey. I think that we would want to talk to some of those users as part of a DB. Process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can, I can, uh, you know, give contacts for all of these people. Um, but it, it's just to be perfectly honest, it just hasn't been my goal to kind of track each and every person in terms of their production usage. Hey, Matt, this is uh, Lee Calico. Quick question um, with respect to support for tracing. You mentioned uh, Lightstep and Zipkin. And uh, just looking through the GitHub issues, um, just to clarify, currently there's uh, Envoy does not support uh, open tracing. Is that right? This is kind of a thorny topic that is going to make us run out of our, our few minutes very quickly. Um, open tracing still doesn't have a stable C++ API. Um, so that's, 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 been, that's been kind of the reason that, that we haven't done it. Um, so, you know, that's something that I've been working with Ben on. Um, and, you know, I would love to see that happen. But from a pragmatic perspective, we've chosen to basically build the functionality right in. Um, when, there's a, when there's a stable C++ uh, open tracing API, the way that the abstractions work within Envoy, it, it should be fairly straightforward to actually swap it in. Okay. One last one. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, architecture currently is a separate process. Um, and uh, clearly pros and cons to that. Uh, has there been any discussion or thought about whether you would want to provide an option to have it as a library as well? Or is yeah. it simply single process, a separate process? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when I originally kind of started working on the code, I, I had originally designed it so that it, it could be a, a library. And in fact, I, I know, I can't speak about it, but I do know of some more science project D type stuff of people are already working on embedding Envoy in, in other things. So the code is written in a way such that it could be it, it basically could be embedded. So I don't I don't see any reason that that couldn't happen. Um, from my perspective, though, at least from a from a user kind of angle, the benefit from operations of having it be out of process is just too it's too powerful. So like I I personally think that ninety nine percent or more of people will end up using Envoy in, in an out of process perspective, but there's nothing to preclude it from being built into process if there's like a super high perf thing that, that basically has to happen. Thanks. That answers the question. All right. Uh, can you turn yourself onto me? Okay, thanks everyone. Hold on. How do I? Oops, I'm sure. Okay, thanks. Got it. Sound off. Thanks, Matt. Uh, we've got some comments on the chat from Doug Davis as well. Appreciation there. Um, can we go on to the next slide, uh, Chris? I'm actually not able to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. Uh, I, I think you also want to mention that you're you're interested in sponsoring this project, correct? Yeah. Sorry, I'm having I'm struggling slightly with actually trying to get the screen up at the moment. Uh, no worries. I'll I'll get my I'll get the screens up in a second. Okay. <laughs> this is Ken. I'd I'd be happy to sponsor. Right. So we have two volunteers to sponsor: myself and Ken. Um, Ken, let's follow up on that out of out of band. Um, but I think that. The question we are asking at this point is, again, is there a voting member of the TOC who thinks we should not invite Envoy to proceed to a formal proposal? We have sponsors um, and we've had the basic presentation. Okay, so nobody spoke out then, so we will proceed. Uh, this, is, this, is great. Yeah, hey. this is Brian Grant. I just want to speak in favor of this. We did some technical diligence on a number of the alternatives and that slide that's showing now, the blend of performance and uh, flexibility and pluggability really was unique among the alternatives. So that's why we chose to invest in that and we're using it with Istio. Good, thanks, Brian. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, yeah, this is Christopher. Uh, I'm not a EOC member, uh, obviously, but I would be fully in support of uh, Envoy. And we, again, just like some other people said here, we've done some due diligence and, and this is the one that stood up sort of head and shoulders above the rest. 
Okay, happy times. Uh, let's move on. Cool. See awesome. the proposal. Uh, good. Cool. Working group. So the next phase will be, I believe, um, Hippie Hacker talking us through this effort. Is that correct, Chris? Yeah, uh, HH or Denver, are you on? Hello, hello. This is Chris. Hey, how's it going, Chris? Uh, yeah, do you want to share your screen instead of uh, me doing it? Sure, yeah. I'll pass that over to Denver. Denver and okay. I are the. Uh, okay, cool, cool. I'll uh, unshare my screen once I figure out. There we go. Cool. Uh, it should be ready for you to share. Awesome. I'll let Denver take over for the presentation portion, but I would like to introduce uh, where the II Cooperative and uh, II is for Inclusive Integration. And we're really passionate about getting everyone to cooperate together and inclusively integrate all of the CNCF projects. And um, RCI solutions um, bring together cross cloud, uh, across as many clouds as we want to support, and across all the projects. Uh, so I'll go ahead and turn that over to Denver. Uh, if you're ready. If Denver's having trouble, I'm fine sharing uh, the screen, but uh, I don't hear I, I, I don't hear Denver at all. <laughs> So I'm fine uh, sharing the screen. So how about that? Unless um, you could get it working. You there, HH? Uh, I am here. Um, Denver's in another location. Just one second. Okay. Yeah, no worries. I'm 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 fine driving if if if, if that's what we need to do. Hey folks, we've only got 17 minutes left on the call, so move fast. Can you hear us live now? We're having some trouble with audio. I think there may be some trouble with the audio. Yeah. I could share the screen, HH, and you could just guide me if that works. All right, let's, here we go. Just tell me when you need to switch. Uh, oh, never mind. It looks like. Can you hear us all right? Yeah, we hear you fine. Oh, awesome, we're having some audio troubles. No worries, and DLX has shared the screen, so it looks good to go. All right, so you can see the slides all right. Uh, share it again. We don't see slides right now. Perfect. We see slides. Success. Awesome. All right. So, Cross Cloud is a project, a CI project that's been worked on in conjunction with the CI working group to be able to continuously test the interoperability of CNC projects across multiple cloud providers. On the call today, we have myself and Chris, and we're both being the technical architecture leads in the project. So before we get into the slides, I'm just gonna quickly go to get that here and trigger a demo. So we can go to this branch here and we can get it this far. And then we can do a commit. And that will trigger off the pipeline. And we can see that running here. And we'll revisit this soon. 
So why cross cloud CI? Well, the CI working group has been tasked with demonstrating best practices for testing the interoperability of projects in the CNCF ecosystem. So what is it? It's a project to continuously validate every commit on stable and head for on supported cloud providers and publishing the results to a public dashboard. So we're demonstrating three projects today. Prometheus, Cordinus, and Kubernetes. Eventually targeting all CNCF projects. So these are the cloud providers we're using to test CNCF projects, GCE, GKE, AWS, and Packet. But eventually targeting all public, bare metal, and private clouds. So what do the stages look like? First, we start off with a project, a commit on the project. It will then trigger a build of the project, compile the artifacts as well as an end-to-end -end test. It will then package the release with a container and push to a, get a registry, Docker registry. And then we trigger cross-cloud, which will then pull in those artifacts, deploy mm -hmm. Kubernetes to multiple cloud providers, it will then test or then deploy to those clouds and it will then test the deployment to make sure that they're valid. See, so here we have cross project pipelines. So we see Kubernetes going through the build phase, doing a release, and then triggering cross cloud. Same for Cordianus and Prometheus. And what happens when it triggers cross cloud is it also passes in the pinnings for the version of Kubernetes you want to use and additional pinnings if you want to pin your Docker version or your Etsy version, as far as maybe CNI plugins as well. So the stages for each cross project pipeline are build, package, release the artifact pinning, and then trigger cross cloud, passing that artifact pinning to cross cloud. And if we go back to the pipeline, we can see that happen here. We've gone through the build for the artifacts. The container, we've pushed that to a Docker registry. Then we've created a release pinning, and then we've triggered cross-cloud. And we can go here and we can see that we've pulled in the artifacts, and now we're deploying Kubernetes to the four cloud providers. So compiled binary artifacts published per commit and you go to these URLs, you can see the published binaries as well as their release pinning files. And the container images are pushed per commit. And then this is what our release pinning files look. We have the image it built and pushed to the registry as well as the tag, which also references the commit for that build. So what can we do with these project artifacts? cross-cloud pipeline stages overview. So this is where an overview of us collecting each project's artifact pinning, deploying, and then we use Helm charts to pass in the image tag of the project we want to deploy, and then we run into end tests. So and go back to the pipeline view, and I think this is still deploying clouds. So we've deployed two clouds now, we're still deploying GC and AWS. So this is an overview of the cross-cloud deploy stage. So we run this provision, which includes the cloud on the deploy, and then we also pass in the other pinnings we want at this stage, like the Kubernetes binaries to use for the deployment, as well as an Etsy pinning, a Docker pinning. And then we wait for that endpoint to be up, and once it's validated, we continue on to uh, deploying the projects, as well as after that. So this is a deploy phase. So we're using Helm to deploy the projects. And then the end-to-end -end phase where we're using upstream Kubernetes conformance tests to verify the Kubernetes clusters. And then we're also using upstream tests for the other projects, Cordiness and Prometheus, where they're available or creating some form of other tests to verify that the deploy was successful. 
So here's an overview of the project pipelines. We have Kubernetes, building, release, and then triggering cross cloud and the same for Cortinas and Prometheus. So here we have the full overview of the pipeline again, and we can revisit this and we see that it's now moved on to deploying the projects and it's deployed CordiNS on GKE and we're waiting for the other deployments to continue. So cross-cloud CI technology overview, what are we using? So unified CI CD system platform to run our jobs, we're using GitLab. Cross-cloud provisioning to bring up Kubernetes clusters. We're currently using Terraform in combination with CloudNet to get the binaries and configuration manifests on disk. And then for deploying our projects and being able to specify the pinned version of the image we want to deploy, we're using Helm. And we're also using Helm to deploy our end-to-end -end tests direct, directly to the cluster. And we're also currently working on a CI status dashboard, which is still in the design phase, where we want to submit these results to. So here we have the CI status dashboard overview, where we can see the projects, Kubernetes, Prometheus, and we can see the status of the build for both the stable and head releases, whether they succeeded or failed, and then it moves on to the deploy phase of deploying those artifacts and projects to the, to the four cloud providers we have, and then a verification of whether that was successful or not. Then we have a deploy view, which is a more defined filter view of the jobs. So here we're looking at Prometheus on AWS. How did that deployment work? So we have the success or the failure status, the commit for the artifact it deployed, and also the job ID and the pipeline that ran, and then a date and time for when that job was run. There are also some additional dashboard views we have available in the cross-cloud readme. So documentation, in our readme we cover why cross-cloud, what is it, and how to use it. We also have some details on how to get started, how to contribute. And then in our FAQ, we also cover what cloud providers are targeted at the moment, what do cross-cloud and cross-project components test, why do we choose Terraform, why do we choose CloudNet, and what are the dependencies we rely on at the moment, and also how do we configure a run our Kubernetes deployments. So what's next? We're planning to add new cloud targets, Bluemix and Azure, and also new projects, FluentD, gRPC, and LinkerD. And we have presentations planned for Prometheus and CordiNS, as well as we're planning to do a presentation to the governing board at OSS. And we also will be doing a presentation to the end user committee on October 12th. So if we revisit this pipeline now, we can see that it's successfully clicked the artifacts, deployed the clouds, the projects, and it's now running the end-to-end -end tests for Kubernetes clusters, which take a long time. So are there any questions? I have a question. Um, if one of the boxes is red, what happens next? Uh, it depends where it's red because, for example, if Kubernetes fails, then the other projects would theoretically be unable to deploy. So we're going to have a failover. So if the newest version fails, then roll back and use a stable, trusted version of Kubernetes we know works. So we don't get this complete dashboard of red. Would you, would you expect to talk to the project leads immediately if something was read? We could have status notifications that would send out, okay, so it failed or there was a warning and send out a status notification to that project. Is it, is it always a problem if something is read or can it be uh, a historical artifact that we leave as is? Um, I'll let Chris answer that one, I think. 
Sure. As we see how stable the releases are, we need to have an idea of whether we're getting false positives or not. So I think as we go along, we'll be able to figure out when it's okay to do notifications. Um, for the initial phases, um, we'll probably just gather feedback and communicate with the different projects um, as they collaborate with us and find the best way to interact with that team, whether it's uh, contacting a mailing list or contacting a big group of people for when that failure happens. It's not always going to be critical. Uh, Denver and Chris, uh, could you give us an indication of, of what kind of investment would be required from a CNCF project to, first of all, develop whatever integration is necessary to, to get that project working on the system? And then secondly, there's presumably some kind of long-term maintenance uh, required to, you know, keep everything working together. R roughly, what is the size of that investment required? Well. Wow. At the moment, the investment required to get a project working with us would be simply support on building from source and then maybe contributing or helping with end-to-end -end tests or test how do we, what's a good way to verify this project. Okay, but in, but in between those two points, there's, there's uh, you know, a bunch of installation and configuration, et cetera. Um, and you know that has to line up with whatever's in your system. If if the uh, canonical configuration and installation scripts for a given project don't tie up with what your system expects, or vice versa, um, there's going to be some work and maintenance required. There. This is Dan Kahn. I I I, I think there will be work involved and in, in particularly on lower level things like uh, container D or, or rocket thinking about the, the best way to integrate those. Um, but our current expectation is that CNCF is going to be funding the development of that um, initial integration. And so to the degree we have an expectation on the projects is that once we're avoiding false positives, they keep an eye on this and not intentionally break it uh, and, and work with us. But, but it's not, some a, a new testing load we're looking to put onto our projects, if at all possible. I've got a question. Um, so, in terms of specific features that, that Kubernetes may advertise to to support the applications, I can I can think about one specifically, like dynamically provisioned storage for Prometheus. Uh, how would that look inside of here if, if the tests were expanded to include? You know, Prometheus using dynamically provision storage and then testing the ability for you know, that container to be deployed to, to different hosts. So how we're creating or doing deployments right now is we, we do a trigger to cross cloud and we do a trigger to the project. So in that trigger, we could pass additional options like, okay, so we want to use the storage. So the cluster would be configured with that storage class as a default or wanting to be used. And then we could include that in our Helm template or with our Helm install command to go, okay, we're wanting to use this form of storage and deploy using that. Thank you. Sorry, this is one question. Do you do any integration with GitHub hooks or anything like that? Right now, we're syncing all our repos from GitHub. So as soon as there's a commit on GitHub, we're syncing the repo down to our GitLab instance and we can run jobs right then. And we're also going to be, from the dashboard view we were creating, linking to upstream GitHub commits. Currently, it's a sync on a timer. And we're looking into using the hooks at a later point. Thanks. Okay, everybody. Um, Matt and I are being boosted out of our conference room here at Lyft. So I'm going to declare um, the hour is up. Um, I feel that there's going to be more discussion on this. So let's have another readout soon. And I would invite people to ask questions on the TOC list. I've also posted a follow up for Envoy on the TOC list for comment. And Chris, I'm about to email you that notary.
All right, no worries. Cool. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks.